so i'll be talking about uh, this small topic abdominal compartment syndrome so this can be definitely be asked in an exam so it's just good to know the salient points about this syndrome so we'll talk about intraabdominal hypertension so if you look at the waveform of intraabdominal hypertension as you see this is end expiration so during end inspiration your intraabdominal pressure goes up and uh, so and then during expiration it can comes down and end inspiration it goes up so that is the basic uh, waveform of how intraabdominal pressure looks so normally the intraabdominal pressure is around 5 mm mercury so intraabdominal hypertension is defined as when there is sustained so the word sustained is important so when we cough or when we have any acute illness the intraabdominal pressure may go up. but when there is a sustained increase in the intraabdominal pressure more than 12 so 12 is the limit 12 mm mercury you would call it as intraabdominal hypertension and what this intraabdominal hypertension does is it causes changes in the microcirculation so it, ch it causes changes in the circulation of the bowels and in the microcirculation as well so these are the grades of intraabdominal hypertension grade 1 is 12 to 15 grade 2 is 16 to 20 grade 3 is 21 to 25 and grade 4 is more than 25 so the definition of abdominal compartment syndrome so intraabdominal hypertension is not equal to abdominal compartment syndrome so when you have to say someone is an abdominal compartment they should have sustained increase in intraabdominal pressure more than 20 mm mercury along with new onset single organ failure or multi organ failure or in other words if they start developing hypotension or if the peak airway pressure goes up and uh, there is respiratory deterioration or neurological deterioration any of the organ failure that sits in you would call it as abdominal compartment syndrome and as i have to reiterate intraabdominal hypertension is not same as abdominal compartment syndrome and we need to understand there are different stages of the same pathological process so it goes through different stages so sustained increase in intraabdominal pressure starts affecting multiple organs so it is a dynamic sort of a process that happens so does it have any bearing on outcome mortality so when patient has grade 3 intraabdominal hypertension and abdominal compartment syndrome there can be 3 to 5 fold increase in the risk of mortality so it does have a bearing if someone has intraabdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment it has a direct bearing on morbidity and mortality so it does increase the risk of mortality 3 to 5 times so we should be worried about this and along with this it what your abdominal compartment syndrome does is it causes activation of inflammatory mediators there is activation of both pro inflammatory and anti so there is a surge response that develops due to the fact that someone has intraabdominal hypertension or abdominal compartment syndrome and the activation of this surge response with activation of pro inflammatory and anti inflammatory leads to hypoxemia hypotension and hypovolemia and all this at a gut level because it's all happening in the abdomen there will be breach of the mucosal barrier and there is translocation of bacteria that happens at the gut which means it lead to overwhelming sepsis bacteremia and multi organ failure so it can lead to that also okay so the sers is activated as part of abdominal and that can lead to even overburdening sepsis because of breach in the gut mucosal barrier and translocation of bacteria that leads to mods and death so this is the sort of pathology pathophysiological ramifications of intraabdominal hypertension so i think some people would monitor abdominal compartment or intraabdominal pressure by doing abdominal gurt but this is obsolete so i have to say your clinical examination as a tool to identify someone with abdominal compartment or your abdominal girth as an indicator for abdominal compartment is uh, is obsolete i don't think we should practice because this was shown from these two studies sensitivity is only 40% it is grossly inaccurate so we should not we should abandon the practice of doing abdominal girth measurement or identifying patients based on clinical palpation and percussion and all that so the intra abdominal pressure the way you measure it the tools that you would use should be accurate should be reliable and should be reproducible 
so the reason why uh, when you are identifying any tool i think what we need to understand is the abdominal fluid character is non compressible as per the pascal's law so the best way is to measure with vesicle pressure so gold that is the gold standard for intra abdominal pressure monitoring so this is the setup so where you have a bladder which is connected to the back and it's connected to pressure transducer and you measure the pressure with manometer so this is the modern way so intra abdominal pressure so we have this urinary catheter this is the bladder so you make sure there is 25 cc of fluid there water or saline and you connect to the three way then uh, it is connected to the pressure bag and pressure transducer and monitoring is done so in this way you would get a continuous monitoring of intra abdominal pressure uh, which is lot more accurate and zeroing is done at mid axillary line at the level of iliac crest so that is the level at which uh, zeroing is done so how do you manage once you identify <coughs> patients with intra vesicular pressure by putting a three way connecting to transducer with 25 ml of saline water in the bladder how do you treat so the main approach to management is we have to improve the abdominal wall compliance okay so how do we improve so we have to make sure because your intra abdominal pressure increases during inspiration and reduces during expiration so if patient is very restless or agitated so obviously the pressures tend to go up so they one has to make sure that they are optimally sedated and if needs be neuromuscular blockage the reason is your airway pressure keeps going up okay once the abdominal compartment has settled and you have to evacuate all the intraluminal contents so which means if patient is not having rails tube rails mm -hmm. tube or nasogastric tube has to be put in to decompress the stomach and gastric emptying has to be facilitated by using erythromycin or metoclopramide and your colonic evacuation has to be facilitated you could use neostigmine or perostigmine or put a flatus tube to evacuate which we do it in our regular practice so any patient with abdominal compartment syndrome make sure there is a nasogastric tube to decompress stomach and there is a colonic you know flatus tube one could use or drugs like isostigmine or neostigmine to facilitate colonic emptying and gastric emptying with erythromycin and metoclopramide and while you are doing this make sure that you are ahead of the potassium there is no way that these patients can remain hypokalemic because that worsens the vicious cycle so hypokalemia has to be aggressively treated the, the third way of addressing abdominal is to evacuate all abdominal fluid collection so if they have ascites ascites has to be drawn has to be drained if they have pleural effusion pleural fluid has to be drained or if they have a pocket of collection focal collections all that will contribute or add on to rising intra abdominal pressure so you may have to put pigtail and drain those collections focal collections so you empty all the viscous by putting tubes by nasogastric or flatus and any other extraneous fluids ultrasound sonologically we need to drain them out so commonest is ascites if you have we have to drain if there's any focal collection Like typically we would see sort of abdominal compartment in dengue where we have over resuscitated then they do develop lot of ascites so we do an ultrasound and drain the by pigtail we drain it out otherwise they would go into compartment which would worsen their hypotension increase their airway pressure worsens the gas exchange so all this can be mitigated by draining so that's the relation this is the last slide relation between intra abdominal contents and intra abdominal pressure is exponential like any other icp trace you would see there is always one critical level until which your increase in intra abdominal volume does not lead to increase in the intra abdominal pressure but suddenly there is a critical threshold after which there is an exponential increase in the intra abdominal pressure when there is slight increase in the volume so it's very typical to your icp curve so we need to be aware that there is always a critical threshold over which increase in the volume is directly proportional to exponential increase in the pressure so thank you very much so i end my talk with this quote great day begins with prayer thank you